Gentlemen, I really would like to take an opportunity to talk to you tonight about a very powerful topic. I'm not convinced that this is the make me feel good speech that a lot of times, thank God, we run into together. And there's a reason for that speech. It's in order to give people inspiration. But sometimes, when you get the boys together and you want to talk real, genuine truth, Sometimes we have to really talk about the challenges of life. And even more so, we need to talk about the challenges of life when you are expecting things and they didn't come true. This is a big topic. This is a topic about the guy that went out and did the right thing. And because he did the right thing, he really expected certain results. And they didn't come. How does one make peace with situations that I went out, I sacrificed, I did my part, I expected a whole unbelievable outcome, and the outcome just didn't come? Rabbi, you told me that if I close my store on Shabbat, I'm going to get such blessing that it's going to be a greater blessing than even the entire seven days of the week. Where till now, I said, hey, my biggest day in retail, my biggest day, holiday season, jewelry, diamonds. My biggest day is Saturday. My biggest day is the weekends. Especially now, we got the holiday season coming. The weekends are very big in the season. And Rabbi, you told me to take the leap of faith and you told me that you'll see that if, 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 if you close your store on Shabbat and you don't work on Shabbat, you're going to get such a blessing that's going to be bigger and greater. You're going to make more money in six days than you did once upon a time in seven days. That's what you promised me. And I went, I listened, and I did it. And I closed. I closed Friday afternoon. I came home on time. I took a shower like a mensch. I went to shul like a king. I had a beautiful Shabbat meal, Shabbat a day with my family. It was great. I loved it. I would do this anytime. What a gift Shabbat is. But then, after starting to do this week after week, month after month, I start taking a look at the bottom line and the spreadsheets are showing that I'm losing money. Not only aren't I making more than the monies I once made when I was open Shabbat, but now I'm not even cutting it. I'm not even making the money I once made. What's going on here? I went out and did a great thing. I expected a certain result. And the results didn't pan out. What do you say to a guy like that? Or maybe a better question. What do you say to yourself? A lot of us ran into this. Matter of fact, every single one of us runs into this test. It's a very powerhouse test, big test. And this is not an easy one to handle. And that's why I wanna talk about it tonight. It's not a comfortable share tonight, but it's real. It's a very real class tonight. Very real, real topic. It's a real topic about the guy that comes along and hears that if he gives 20% ma'aser, he has a promise as it's written in the Sefer and Nefesh HaChaim. Reb Chaim Voloshner writes, you give 10% maaser, that maintains your money. You won't lose, and you'll have blessing in your money. But if you listen to the real words of the Torah, aser, te'aser, where it says the word aser, te'aser, eser, eser, twice, says Reb Chaim Velazhen, that's coming to allude to giving what's called chomish. That's not 10, but 20% maaser. He says the 20% maser giver is the one that's promised by God incredible wealth. So here's a guy, and boy, boy, guys, have I experienced this with so many guys over the years who took this unbelievable leap of faith and took Hashem in as a partner, so to speak, into their business. They made him a 20% partner. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of times when guys do this at first, the calculations they make are totally off. They really don't, no one ever taught them the laws 
of Maaser. They don't know how to calculate. They don't know what they're allowed to or not allowed to take. What is Chayav in Maaser? What's not Chayav in Maaser? Okay, so one day we'll have a class on Maaser and get the clarity of the real way to calculate Maaser according to Halacha. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the guy who did it right. He did it right. He really took 20% Maaser off of the monies that he made in totality that month, month by month. And then he heard from the rabbi how important it is, the words of the Chafetz Chaim, that when a person wants to really see the blessing of Maaser, it's not just the giving of the money that you give to Hashem, the 20%, but it's the calculation of the money on a daily basis. The Chafetz Chaim used to tell people, you want to really see a blessing in your money? Keep a diary. Now today, we don't need diaries because we have fancy phones. Today, you can pull up an app. Today, you can pull up your notes. Today, you can pull up your calendar. Any dollar that comes into your pocket from wherever it may come to, write it down that day. At the end of the month, you make one big calculation of every nickel that came to you that month and take 20% off of it. Says the Chafetz Chaim, it's not just the taking of the 20% that's the blessing of Maser, but it's the daily calculation of every day's income, of what comes to you on a daily basis that kind of drums up the blessings in the wealth of a person and finally the giving of the Maser. Here's a guy who did it. He listened to the rabbi. He went out. It's not easy to give 20% of what you make. It's not easy. It's not, it's not easy to give 10%. 20% definitely not easy. But this guy was real. He took the money, he gave it to a kolel. He took the money, he gave it to a Torah center. He took the money, he gave it to a yeshiva. He took the money and he gave it to a poor person. He took the money and he gave it to widows and orphans, which is considered one of the biggest tzedakot possible. He did real, he did right, he did good. And then all of a sudden, after six months of giving 20% maaser, at first, he saw blessing, it started working. As he was giving, he started getting more. From the craziest of places, places he didn't even believe he would ever get from. And as time went on, he got more and more and more. And then all of a sudden, suddenly, six months, eight months, a year down the line, after giving Maser, all of a sudden, everything stopped. It was as if someone flipped the switch on his business and his business started drying up. And now, not only is he making the money that he used to make when he started giving the Maser, but now his business is starting to tank. His business is drying up. He's not even making the money he used to make. What's going on? But I did what I was supposed to do. How come I'm not seeing the results? And just the opposite. Not only aren't I seeing the blessing, but if anything, things got worse. What do you tell a guy like that? What do you tell yourself when that happens? You should never know. I'm saying, but what do you tell yourself? How do we reckon with this? You guys will be surprised. Over the years, in my position, obviously, I had the opportunity to deal with a lot of different guys, and some of them were Baalei Teshuvah. You know how many times I heard from people? Rabbi, you know, before I became Baal Teshuvah, I was making mad money, you know that? All of a sudden, I become religious, and ba-boom! <laughs> what happened? If you would have told me this beforehand, I would have told you, deal off! Deal off! No deal! What's going on? When I wasn't religious, I was swimming in the money. All of a sudden now, I start keeping Shabbat. I put on tzitzit. I'm praying three times a day with Minyan. I don't miss Tefillin not a day anymore. I'm doing everything right. Everything. And yet, the better I'm becoming, the more my funds are depleting. This is not what I expected as the result of coming closer to God. I thought the closer you come to God, the more blessed you become. And instead, I'm getting a total opposite reaction here. What, what do we do with this? This is a very tough situation. Every single person out there deals with this question in some different style or type of scenario. And that's why I think tonight's the, the right night to touch upon a major topic. 
We just read that Abraham Avinu did the greatest test that any Jew, maybe any human alive, has ever passed in the history of the world. He was told by God to take his son and to bring him up to be slaughtered on Har HaMoriah. This is that Ram Avinu that spent his life up until this point preaching to the entire world that there's only one God and that all their idols and all their Avodah Zarah is all bogus because what type of idol, what type of God would ask you to bring your children as human sacrifice? And sure enough, what does Hashem ask him to do? Hashem asks him, Abraham, I want you to bring your son as a sacrifice to me. And it's amazing, at that moment, we could probably guess what was going through Abraham Avinu's head. Abraham did not say a word. Not one word. He could have said, God, are you joking? You know what this is going to make me and you look like? It's going to be on the front page of the New York Times. Abraham, the biggest hypocrite that ever lived. I mean, he spent his life telling everybody that what God would ask you to sacrifice your kids, and now he's going to sacrifice his son. But he did not say a word to God. He stuck to his faith. Hashem, if this is what you ask me, I'll do it. But what do you mean? Are you going to make it look like a hypocrite? doesn't matter. This is what Hashem told me to do. He has a reason. And it's much further than my understanding. I'm following, I'm doing it. Not only did he do it, guys, but the Pasuk says, Vayashkem Abraham Baboker. You know what Vayashkem means? Hashkama. It means very early in the morning. He didn't just get up the next day to do it. He got up very early and hurried with Zirizut to do it. I mean, something like that. You don't have to go to the Vatikin Minyan to get done. You can wait till the later Minyan. Keep your son alive for another two, three hours. It's not that bad. No. He got up really early and rushed to do God's will. In spite of the fact that it was against everything he was preaching. Because he believed in God beyond question. And here Abraham Avinu goes. And he passes the greatest test in history. A test that till today, thousands of years later, and we still hang on the reward, the drawstrings, the merit of that test. On Rosh Hashanah, what do we tell God? Remember Akedah Yitzchak and forgive us, their children. On Yom Kippur, what do we talk about? Akedah Yitzchak and forgive us, their children. That's how huge of a test it was. It was so big that it still stands for us thousands of years later till today. He, he passed the biggest test ever. Now you would think that if you passed a test that's so humongous that it's able to help your kids for thousands of years to come, you are good to go. You proved yourself. There's no questions anymore on you when it comes to your service with God. You, you passed the highest test. And that's actually what God, what God said. At least the angel said to Abraham Avinu after he passed, Now I see that you are a true God-fearing person beyond question. It's amazing. You'd think at that point, Abraham Avinu's on easy street. And what happens? He comes back from passing the biggest test in the world, and he comes home, to a wife that is dead. Like we read in last week's parasha, Hayasara. He comes home from the biggest test. And you think he's coming home to a parade. A ticker tape parade. He's coming home to the parade of the New York Yankees. Lahavdil. He's coming home to the biggest parade in the city, you'd expect. You'd expect. And you know what he came home to? No parade. He came home to a funeral of his own wife. He couldn't even share it with her. It's unbelievable. And because of this, Rabbeinu Yonah writes that I always thought when Abraham was tested with the 10 famous tests, we thought that test number 10, the toughest test, the highest test, the most difficult test, 
was Akedah Yitzchak. We, that's what we always taught. We always taught Akedah Yitzchak was number 10. Says Rabbi Yonah, no. Akedah Yitzchak was test number 9. You want to know what test number 10 was? The biggest test of all? Test number 10 is to come home to Sarah Imenu Dehni. And to have no regret and to have no complaints on God. Like the Pasuk says, Veliv Kota. Abraham cried for his wife when he came home and found her dead, but it's written with a very small little letter to tell you that he cried, but not overly in the way of complaint, just enough to cry of what a normal husband cries for a wife in a funeral. No complaints. come home from the biggest sacrifice you've ever made in your life. And you said, Hashem, look, look what I did. Now I'm expecting me and you to be on uh, the streets of gold. And what does he come home to instead? The results that he would never imagine. He came home to a funeral. Says Rabbeinu Yonah, this was the biggest test. You went out, you killed yourself, you sacrificed. You did it with Shem Shamayim. You did it for God's sake. And you expected that this is going to be the big one that's going to bring you such great results and instead it brings you a funeral? And you don't throw in the towel? And you don't complain? And you still hold somehow to your unbelievable, unwavering faith and reliance on God? That was the biggest test that Abraham passed. That, says Rabbi Yonah, was test number 10. And guess what? We, our Hashem, are not tested with tests on the caliber of Akedah Yitzchak. Forget about that. Oh boy. But we are tested. And we are asked to sacrifice a lot in our life when it comes to being an honest, upright, God-fearing Jew. And when we pass those tests after we really gave it all we got and sacrificed, we really do expect that there's going to be some big bounty parade reward result. And sometimes the results don't go our way. Are we one and all? Why? Why, 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 why did it? Why didn't I have this standing ovation waiting for me after I did all that? How come I came home, God forbid, to a funeral? I was expecting a parade. These are not the results I was expecting, Rabbi. I went out and I gave big tzedakah to the shul. I thought I'd get a blessing in business, and instead things got worse. I really thought I'd start doing better once I closed on Shabbat, and for some reason now my business is doing even less. I started keeping Tarat and Mishpacha, thinking that that will bring Shalom Bayit between me and my wife. And for some reason, we're still fighting. How come the results didn't pan out? That was the test number 10 of Abraham Avinu. That was a big one. Says Rabbi Yonah, it was such a big test that it was number 10 even after Akedah Yitzchak. Meaning, this might have been a tougher test than even Akedah Yitzhak. And that's a wow. Because we're faced with these tests. And the question is, how do you make sense of this? Why? Why? Why can't things just make sense? Why is it that the good guys always finish last? How come when I become good and I expected good results, it doesn't happen? And the guy down the block that's still partying in life, and it seems that things are going well for him. Now, I'm not touching on the tzaddik viraro rasha betovo concept that's beyond our grasp. But we want to try to get a little bit of an understanding here. What's going on? When the results don't pan out, how do we make peace with such a situation? Open up your hearts, guys. <clears throat> I have a very good friend 
who I personally sat and we learned together the entire book of Chobat Alabam, from cover to cover. And we did it again. And this guy, honestly, has grown in the area of Emunah Bitachon leaps and bounds. And that's an understatement. Guy became a real Bal Boteach, real Bal Bitachon. He relies on Hashem, trusts in Hashem. Everything to him is Hashem. Doesn't trust in anything else. Doesn't rely on anyone else but God for everything. I sat down and learned with him the laws of Maaseh. And he went out and he took the leap of faith and he started give, giving 20% Maaser every single month from the money that he made. He has an Amazon business and he was giving 20% of the monies he was making month by month by month. In the beginning, in the first year when he started, right at the get-go, when he started giving the Maaser, his business took off like a rocket. It was like, wow. It was like not even normal, wow. And for the first year, the guy who made more money than he even thought he'd make. The results were beyond wow. And then suddenly, after that first year of doing so well, it's like somebody flipped the switch. His business tanked. All of a sudden, he went from selling fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a day to 10 sales. The peanuts. He looks at last year's numbers as opposed to the same time this year. And it was like the margins weren't even on the same page. Last year he was doing maybe a hundred times the business that he was doing the next year. And he's still giving the same answer. And he doesn't get it. What's going on? You know, he said to me, it's one thing if I'm not having the big blessing that I had last year but at least let me maintain the business. But I'm watching things slide and crash. My business is going down to nil, to nada, to nothing. I'm starting to deplete even my, sa my savings. What's going on here? So he called up a rabbi in Euclid, Ohio. The grandson of Rabbi Miller, same Rabbi Brog. Rabbi Brog gives fantastic, amazing shiuri on Torah anytime on these topics of emunah and bitachon. And he says beautiful stuff. And this guy that I learned with, he listens during work to this Rabbi Brog's classes. And he says to me, I don't know what to make of it. I'm calling Rabbi Brog. I got to ask him. So he gets Rabbi Brog on the phone from Euclid, Ohio. And he says, Rabbi, this is my situation. I'm giving 20% Maser. I'm a real Baal Boteach. I believe only in Hashem. I'm relying on him. I learned the laws with my rabbi. I know I'm doing it right now. First year, boom! And then right after the first year, prach! What's going on? I'm losing money. I'm not even maintaining the business. I'm starting to eat into my savings. What's going on? And I didn't stop giving. The guy didn't stop giving the Maser even when he was losing money. He still didn't stop giving. The rabbi says to him, I want to tell you something. You're not the first call that I've been getting recently from many people who've been telling me they've been doing incredible things with incredible sacrifice, including Maser, and in the beginning, it was something unreal results. And then all of a sudden, it stopped. And they don't know what's going on. The results don't match the sacrifice. And he says, I have to tell you that Hashem has his cheshbonot, and I don't understand them. And I'm praying to Hashem to give me the clarity to understand what's going on and why is he doing what he's doing. But I do want to tell you one thing, he says. Don't get off the train. Don't get off the train. He says, sometimes when a guy takes something new on himself and he goes out and does it and sacrifices 
and he's expecting big results. At first, it starts to pour down on him all the blessing, and then suddenly it stops. You know why? Because God wants to know. People can see what you're doing, but I want to see why you're doing it. Are you doing it just to get the wealth? Are you doing it just to get reward? Or are you doing it because it's the right thing? Why did you decide to start keeping Shabbat? You're doing it because you heard a rabbi's speech that Shabbat is the blessing of the week? You're doing it just for the bottom line? It's a business investment? Or are you keeping Shabbat because that's the right thing to do? Hashem commanded us not to desecrate Shabbat Kodesh. So sometimes Hashem takes the results and he throws it into the test as well. And he uses the results that you were expecting as part of the very test of your sacrifice in the first place. So here is a guy going out and keeping Shabbat week after week, sacrificing to close his store when all his competition is open. And Hashem says, wow, you sacrificed. Well, let's find out why. Are you going to open that store again if you're not making the return outcome money that you expect it to? Is this just a business deal? Because if that's the case, I don't need your money. I wanted you. I wanted you to become a Shabbat person. I wanted you to do it because it's the right thing to do. Because we're soldiers. Because Hashem told me that this is what His will is. And I want to do His will. If you're doing it for me, if you're doing my will, then you'll see the blessing. But if you're doing it only for the money, then if that's the case, I have nothing to do with it, says Hashem. And if I have nothing to do with it, how am I expected to bless you? So he tests you in the result by holding back the good results for a certain period of time just to test you to see, are you going to jump ship? Are you going to get off the train? Were you real when you stepped up to want to do the right thing? Or was this only a temporary get your feet wet just to see if I get out of it what I want? This is not about you. This is not about doing the right thing over the wrong thing. And sometimes there's a qualification period that a person needs to kind of Hold strong and stand through, even when it's painful, and especially when it doesn't make sense. Like Abraham Avinu, who came back from Akedat Yitzchak and expected a different outcome and a result, and instead of the parade, what did he get? The funeral. Now God says, let me see. Are you going to have regret that you left the house and did Akedat Yitzchak? Now that you came home to a dead wife? Or are you going to say, that was God's will, and that I have no regret for. It has nothing to do with this. Let me see where you're holding. Let me see if I take the results and place it as a test as well. Let me see if you're going to still stand strong on the good that you set out to do or not. It's a qualification process. To prove your original intentions. That's a tough one. But guess what? That is the Rabbeinu Yonah that we just spoke about. Says Rabbeinu Yonah, when Abraham came back to his wife at a funeral, that wasn't test number 11. That was test number 10. That was the biggest test of all the tests. To see if you're able to hold to the good and simply do what's right for the sake of it being right and not for the reward. So the rabbi told him, don't get off the train. Stay on the train. Keep going. Hold strong. I know it's bitter. I know it's tough. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. Just prove to him that you're still in it, even though you're not winning it yet. And then Bezat Hashem, you'll see that it'll all come back and much greater. It'll make up for you the time that you expected, along with the time that you're going to have, and it's come down to you, it's going to pour down with you a tremendous blessing. It's amazing. This particular guy held on that train. 
and he kept giving tzedakah even though he wasn't making money. It's unbelievable. He did it for another five months. And then all of a sudden, somebody offered him a new product. He put it up online and boom! The guy made more money than know what to do with himself. It made up from the last year of not making anything. It made up for the last 10 years of whatever he thought he would make. Because he had to qualify. Are you doing it for me? Or are you doing it for you? Sometimes he takes the results and throws them into the test as well. Let me see if you're real. Or let me see if you're going to get off the train. It's tough, but it's true. Gentlemen, I want to end off with a quick story. Because I know we got to catch our beat in two minutes. A friend of mine, he's a rabbi in Israel in a girl's seminary. He teaches in a seminary. This seminary has Ashkenaz, Sephardic girls, the more intellectual girls who go for a real year of learning, a real year of growth. This rabbi comes to America every now and then to recruit and to kind of meet the new students for the coming year. He gives them interviews, picks who he wants, who he doesn't want. So he was here in the United States, and one of his old students were getting married, a Sephardic girl from our community, and he was invited to the wedding. And he was asked to come in time for the chuppah. They wanted to give him a blessing under the chuppah. So he comes into the shul. I'm not going to say where, no names. He comes into the place where the wedding was being held, and he comes in right at the beginning of the chuppah. He walked in at the moment that the marchers were lining up. Now, if you're not from this community, you've never seen the marchers before. See, he, who was not from the community, didn't know what he was seeing, really. He sees a bunch of girls lining up, a bunch of guys lining up. He thought they were going to walk in and, uh, you know, like Broadway, start dancing. He didn't know what to expect. He had no idea. He never saw it before. But as he came closer, trying to figure out how to get inside... One of the girls on that line of marchers was also a student of his from the past year, single girl, and she really, really was not dressed the way a Ba'i Yisrael should be dressed, let alone in the shul, forget about it, but definitely not dressed, she should never be found in the streets that way. And he was so taken, this rabbi, he was so, he didn't, he, just, he was so uncomfortable seeing his student like that, someone who grew so much, someone, someone who, who, who really had such a phenomenal year in Israel with such Yerat Shamaim and someone that really prayed and the Kotel and all night learnings and like the whole nine yards, someone that really excelled. He didn't expect such a regress. He didn't expect it. I mean, she really was just totally not. And for a minute, he like looked at her like, like a deer in headlights, like his jaw dropped, like, what? And that minute, she looked up and she saw him. And her face turned red. And she got so embarrassed. And she ran off the line. And she ran up to the rabbi. And she started crying. And she says, please, don't judge me. Don't judge me. I know this is terrible the way you see me here. You never expect a girl like me to be dressed like this, but I'm begging you, don't judge me. The rabbi says, I'm not judging you, I'm just shocked. And she says, Rabbi, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. My uncles, my mother, they all told me, if I don't dress this way, I'm never getting married. No one's going to look at you. Because if you don't dress in a way that's going to make the guys turn their heads to follow you, no one's going to look at you. So you have to go out there and dress up by not dressing up. Like this, people will only be turned to look at you. That's the only way you get married these days. My uncles told me that. My mom told me that. So it's, it, you have to understand. This is being done with Shem Shamayim. You have to understand that. This is being done with Shem Shamayim. This is L'Shem Yehud Kuchab Rihu. I want to do the mitzvah of getting married. So therefore, I got to break all the Torah rules of a woman 
in order. Just please don't don't judge me. I, I just want to get I want to get married. It's so hard to get married. It's so hard to find a good guy. The rabbi said, dressed like this, you think you're gonna find a good guy? The guys that chase a girl because they're not dressed is a guy that will chase another girl who is not dressed. Is that called a good guy? There's no loyalty there. One day he chases the wind to the left and the next day he chases the wind to the right. You want a real quality guy, appear like a quality girl. Go home and get dressed. And I give you a promise that if you take upon yourself to stick to the real tzinyut, the way you were properly taught to be about Yisrael, the way you be able to carry yourself in the street as a proper young lady without giving yourself away cheaply. I promise you in six months, you'll, get, you'll, you'll find the right guy. She says, you promise? He says, yeah, I promise. And she ran home. And she came back dressed. Now, I know everyone's going to ask me what happened to the guy that was supposed to march with her. Who cares? I'm telling you the way the rabbi told me this story. She runs home, gets dressed, comes back. She comes back after the chuppah. She's dressed like a Bat Yisrael, proper, classy, polished, sanua, with self-worth and self-dignity, carrying herself like a young lady, not throwing herself at the, at the mercy of people. And that night, the rabbi came and complimented her and gave her again the blessing. Six months. I'm going to pray for you. I promise you, you'll see. She says, Rabbi, I'm holding to Tzini'ut. Bezat Hashem, I'm holding you to the promise. Okay, gentlemen, you hear the story? <clears throat> Six months later. Six months later. Literally. Six months later. No, but literally. Like, literally to the day or two. Six months later. The rabbi's in Israel. And he gets a phone call. Rabbi, ah, oh, what's doing? And he's thinking to himself, oh boy, it's six months. What's going on? There's a pause on the phone. And she says, Rabbi, it's six months. He says, I know, no. She says, I didn't get a date in six months. The rabbi thought she was calling to tell him, Rabbi, six months. You hear the champagne bottles in the background? I'm calling you for Malachaim. That wasn't the phone call. You know what the phone call was? Till now, when I was doing their plan of walking around 50% off, at least I was getting dates. Now I'm doing your plan, God plan. I'm walking around Sanua proper. I didn't get a date in six months. Not one day. Where's your promise? I sacrificed. I, I gave it all I got. I went, I, went, I went up against everything. I went up against the social part of it. I went up against the, 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 the peer pressure. I went up against the family pressure. I did the right thing. I stood for the right thing. How come I didn't get a date? The rabbi said he felt my two cents. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. Here's a girl who did her own little Akedat Yitzchak and she came home to a funeral. These, were, these weren't the results that I expected. The rabbi says to her, there's only one thing I can tell you. And I pray to Hashem that you still have enough Yirat Shamayim left in you to just listen to me on this last request. That night when I made you the promise and you found the strength in you to go home and get dressed properly and to take on Siniut the right way for the next six months, what were you telling yourself? I'm going to meet the guy. I'm going to meet the guy. I'm going to meet the guy. I'm going to finally meet the guy. This is going to get me the guy. This is going to get me the guy. Is that what you're telling yourself? Or were you telling yourself, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. Hashem, I'm doing this for you because I know this is the right thing to do. What were you telling yourself? She says, I have to admit to you, 
I was saying to myself, I can't meet the I can't wait to meet the God. I can't wait to meet the God. I can't wait to meet the God. The rabbi says, listen to me. It's not a problem to do things for incentive. But sometimes Hashem wants to know not just what you do, but why did you do it? Because the outcome follow, the outcome of your sacrifice follows your intentions, not your actions. And because of that, he takes the outcome and throws it into the test as well. Listen to me. I'm asking you, one more month, just one more month, continue to do the tzili'ut, what you're doing, but do it and every day say, I'm not going to give this up because I know I'm doing the right thing. Hashem, I'm doing this for you. It's not about the bazra. It's not about the shiduch. It's not about the guy. I'm doing this because this is the way about Israel is supposed to be. I want to do the right thing. And maybe then that will be the qualification of Hashem to see that Siniut is not just an investment for a return, but it's your real new way of life because you want to do the real and right thing. And that's exactly what she did. 30 days later to the night, she calls him back. And this time, he hears the champagne bottles in the background, and she's screaming and crying, I'm engaged, I'm engaged, I can't believe it, I'm engaged, you are right. This time I did it for the right reasons. I qualified the Shom Hashem, and boy was the outcome exactly what the blessing was supposed to be. Gentlemen, remember, he not only wants to see what we're up to and what we're doing, but he wants to know why. Hashem wants the heart more than the act. But the moment he sees the heart is pure, that's the moment that not only is he with us, but there's so much blessing that he, that he surrounds us with. So the next time you come back from your Akedah Yitzchak and you bump into a funeral, God forbid, you should never know, don't get off the train yet. Rethink, why am I doing this? Am I doing it for the right reasons? Let's rethink. Let me get back on and hold tight and continue to give myself chizuk and say, he just wants me to prove to him that I'm real because the minute I'm real, the outcome and the reality becomes real as well. Thank you for listening.